This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Welcome to our show. Well, there's one issue President Bush and presidential hopefuls John McCain and Barack Obama all agree on, expanding the use of nuclear power. President Bush addressed nuclear power at a news conference Tuesday and hailed it as a way to reduce American dependence on oil and protect the environment. This is just a transition period. I mean, all of us want to get away from reliance upon hydrocarbons. But it's not going to happen overnight. You know, one of these days, people are going to be using battery technologies in their cars. You've heard me say this a lot, and I'm confident it's going to happen. And, you know, the throwaway line, of course, is that your car won't have to look like a golf cart. But the question then becomes, where are we going to get electricity? And that's why I'm, I'm a big believer in nuclear power, to be able to make us less dependent on oil and better stewards of the environment. But there is a transition period during the hydrocarbon era, and it hasn't ended yet, as our people now know. Gasoline prices are high. And this is presidential hopefuls Barack Obama, beginning with the Senator John McCain on nuclear power. I actually think that we should explore uh, nuclear power as part of the energy mix. There are no silver bullets. Uh, to this issue. Uh, we've got to develop solar. Uh, I've proposed drastically increasing fuel efficiency standards on cars, an aggressive uh, cap on the amount of greenhouse gases that can be emitted. Uh, but we're going to have to try a series of different approaches. My dear friends, nuclear power must be part of any equation that leads to addressing, that leads to addressing climate change and also leads to addressing reduction of our dependence on foreign oil. You know, we always love to imitate the French. The French, 80% of their electricity in France is generated by nuclear power. We either got to reprocess it or store it. Senator John McCain and before that, Senator Barack Obama. Well, the debate over nuclear power is back in the news with the admission of Energy Department official Ward Sprout on Tuesday that it would cost taxpayers $90 billion to open and operate the nation's first nuclear waste dump. Speaking after a congressional hearing, Sprout added the dump at Yucca Mountain in Nevada would open only in 2020. It was originally estimated to cost $58 billion and open in 1998. Well, our next guest has been described as one of the Western world's most influential energy thinkers. He's also a leading opponent of nuclear power. Amory Lovins is co-founder, chair, and chief scientist of Rocky Mountain Institute in Colorado. He's consultant physicist, MacArthur Fellow, and recipient of numerous awards, including the Right Livelihood Award. Lovins advised the energy and other industries in countries around the world, including here in the U.S. He invented the hybrid hypercar in 91 and has written 29 books books, including Soft Energy Paths, Natural Capitalism, Small is Profitable, and Winning the Oil Endgame. Amory Levins joins us here in our Firehouse studio. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you. It's good to have you with us. Well, talk about nuclear power. Why do you feel it's not an option, given the oil crisis? Well, first of all, electricity and oil have essentially nothing to do with each other and anybody who thinks the contrary is really ignorant about energy. Less than 2% of our electricity is made from oil. Less than 2% of our oil makes electricity. Uh, those numbers are falling, and essentially all the oil involved is actually the heavy, gooey bottom of the barrel you can't even make mobility fuels out of anyway. Uh, what nuclear would do is displace coal, our most abundant domestic fuel, and this sounds good for climate, but actually Expanding nuclear makes climate change worse for a very simple reason. Nuclear is incredibly expensive. The costs have just stood up on end lately. The Wall Street Journal recently reported that they're about two to four times the cost that the industry was talking about just a year ago. Uh, and the result of that is that if you buy more nuclear plants, you're going to get about two to ten times less climate solution per dollar, and you'll get it about 20 to 40 times slower than if you buy instead the cheaper, faster stuff that is walloping nuclear and coal and gas, all kinds of central plants in the marketplace. And those competitors are efficient use of electricity and what's called micropower, which is both uh, renewables, except big hydro, and making electricity and heat together in factories and buildings, which takes about half of the money, fuel, and carbon of making them separately, as we normally do. So. <clears throat> Uh, nuclear cannot actually deliver the climate or the security benefits claimed for it. It's unrelated to oil, and it's grossly uneconomic. 
which means the nuclear revival that we often hear about is not actually happening. Uh, <clears throat> it's a, a very carefully fabricated illusion. Uh, and the reason it isn't happening is there are no buyers. That is, Wall Street is not putting a penny of private capital into the industry uh, despite 100 plus percent subsidies. Why? It's uneconomic. It costs, for example, about three times as much as wind power, which is booming. Uh, let me give you some numbers about what's, what's happening in the marketplace, because that, that's reality as far as I'm concerned. I really take markets seriously. 2006, the last full year of data we have, nuclear worldwide added a little bit of capacity, more than all of it from uprating old plants, because the new ones they built were smaller than the retirements of old plants. So they added 1.4 billion watts. Sounds like a lot. Well, it's, it's about one big plant's worth worldwide. That was less than photovoltaics, solar cells added in capacity. It was a tenth what wind power added. It was a thirtieth to a fortieth what micropower added. What's micropower? Again, it's renewables other than big hydro, plus co-generating electricity and heat together, usually in industry. In 2006, Micropower for the first time produced more electricity worldwide than nuclear did. A sixth of the world's electricity is now Micropower, a third of the new electricity. In a dozen industrial countries, Micropower makes anywhere from a sixth to over half of all the electricity. This is not a fringe activity anymore. Um, China, which has the world's most ambitious nuclear program by the end of 2006, had seven times that much capacity in distributed renewables, and they were growing at seven times faster. Take a look at 2007, uh, in which the U.S. or Spain or China added more wind capacity than the world added nuclear capacity. The U.S. added more wind capacity last year than we've added coal capacity in the past five years put together. And renewables, other than big hydro, got last year $71 billion of private capital. Nuclear, as usual, got zero. It is only bought by central planners with a draw on the public purse. What does this tell you? I mean, what, what part of the story does anybody who take market seriously not get? And yet, uh, well, the media clearly in this country doesn't get it because it is raised over and over again by the candidates. I mean, it seems that uh, Senator McCain has a favorite number, 100 years in Iraq, also hoping for 100 more new nuclear power plants. He had said something about he doesn't want to lose the knowledge of building since the last one was built more than 30 years ago. The people are dying who would build it, so we've got to rush and build them now. Well, it, you could say that's already been lost in the sense that most of a new nuclear plant built now in the U.S., if there were any, uh, would have to be imported, which, by the way, means we buy it in weak U.S. dollars, which is part of the incredible cost escalation we've seen. Uh, Moody's latest number is $7,500 a kilowatt. Uh, that's, a, again, as the journal said, about two to four times the numbers that were being bandied about just last year by promoters. And uh, Barack Obama, while he hasn't laid out a plan for building, he is a big uh, campaign contributor, Exelon, and has supported the expansion of nuclear power. And, of course, we heard what President Bush has to say. Actually, I thought what Senator Obama said was explore, which is different. And, and you will find major environmental groups saying something like explore or consider, but they will also say very carefully it has to be competitive, it has to be cost effective, and clearly yeah, that doesn't even pass the giggle test. Um, a new nuclear plant, according to Moody's, would send out electricity for about 15 cents a kilowatt hour, which is half again as much as the average residential rate, um, and that doesn't even count for delivering it to your house. And I think if, if nuclear plants were built, which I don't think is likely, you would see incredible rate shock and a big political reaction. Um, environmentalists like Stuart Brand and uh, James Lovelock uh, are pushing nuclear power. Uh, there are actually four individuals involved in the world who are prominent environmentalists who have that view, and you've named two of them. Who are the other two? Uh, Patrick Moore uh, was active in founding Greenpeace back in the 70s, and now works uh, for industry. Um, and uh, uh, Peter Schwartz, who used to be on my board, uh, who used to run group planning for World Dutch Shell, uh, is of the same view. 
but there, I can't think of any others. There are no actual environmental groups who favor nuclear power. Uh, what is your answer to them, and why have they arrived? These are your old colleagues. Yeah, well, uh, you know, t t uh, a couple of them are old friends. Well, I think they haven't done their homework. And uh, I keep asking for their analysis and not getting it, because I don't think they have one. But uh, they, they somehow form the view that because nuclear doesn't emit carbon, it must be a good thing. Well, that's not good enough. Uh, you need a source that doesn't emit carbon. Uh, nuclear emits a little bit in the fuel cycle and, and in building plants and so on. But anyone that doesn't emit carbon and is faster and cheaper than other ways to do the same thing. You see, renewables don't emit carbon. Efficiency doesn't emit carbon. Cogeneration based on recovered waste heat you were throwing away anyhow doesn't emit carbon because you already paid for the carbon in making the, way, in the, making the useful part of the heat in industry. And these sources are a great deal cheaper and faster than nuclear. So if climate's a problem, we need to invest judiciously, not indiscriminately, to get the most solution per dollar, the most solution per year. Otherwise, we're making things worse. We're talking to Amory Lovins. He is co-founder, chair, and chief scientist at Rocky Mountain Institute, which is based in Aspen in uh, Colorado. Old snowmass. Old snowmass. <laughs> um, Nuclear power is one of the issues that is being posed as an alternative to reliance on foreign fuel. And this is also an issue we addressed yesterday with Naomi Klein on Democracy Now!, the issue of uh, expanding oil drilling offshore and onshore. You've been looking at this. Well, we're, we seem to be wanting to drill in all the wrong places. Uh, for example, over 50 times as much oil as might be under the Arctic refuge at very high prices can be saved at very low prices by using the oil efficiently, uh, <clears throat> also uh, many times faster. So uh, w my wildcatters have been drilling lately in the Detroit formation. Uh, that is, making efficient cars uh, is equivalent to finding an all-American Saudi Arabia under Detroit, uh, about eight and a half million barrels a day. Uh, inexhaustible, climate safe, and uh, costing about 12 bucks a barrel. Now, <clears throat> altogether, there's about 14 million barrels a day of oil savings, averaging 12 bucks a barrel cost. And uh, <clears throat> we know exactly where the oil is. There's no doubt that it's there. It's under Detroit, Seattle, and so on. That's out of you know, 20 or so million barrels a day we're using. So. If you're an oil company and you go to the ends of the earth and drill for very expensive oil that might not even be there, wouldn't it be embarrassing if somebody else, meanwhile, found all that cheap oil under Detroit? And shouldn't we drill the most prospective place first? I've tried this uh, formulation lately on the American Association of Petroleum Geologists and the American Petroleum Institute, and they found it pretty persuasive. Uh, you know, I've worked for major oil companies for about 35 years, and <clears throat> they understand how expensive it is to drill for oil. That does it for our program, Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.